in the first video on this lecture series on general relativity, we looked at Newton's theory of gravity and identified a few points that seemed, uh, seemed a little bit strange with that theory. And this led us to the need of a new theory, uh, which ended up being general relativity, which describes gravity not as a pulling force, but describes it in a way that a massive object will curve space-time around it. It will change the geometry of space-time around it such that other particles which are moving by this massive object will follow straight lines on this curved space-time. So if I throw a ball on the Earth, uh, throw it in the air, that apparently curved trajectory is actually its natural motion, its natural unimpeded motion in this curved space-time. So we want to see if this new version of gravity matches up or improves on some of the issues that we that we notice with Newton's theory of gravity. So the first issue that we had with uh, Newton's theory of gravity is that the gravitational force seemed instantaneous. So we want to know if if general relativity has that same issue. So so does this does the gravitational force send signals faster than light? Well, let's just draw a simple picture. Let's say I have the sun here, and actually I'm going to move this down a little bit. Let's say I have the sun right here, and I'm going to very crudely draw a representation of the curvature of space-time around that. So you shouldn't take much out of this other than this is kind of trying to illustrate that space is curved, but it shouldn't be used in any way other than that. So let's say the sun automat suddenly disappeared, just instantaneously. So would eventually the space-time around there should flatten out, but does it do it instantaneously? And the answer is that according to the equations of general relativity, at first you're going to see space-time look something like this. Uh, then in this region, let's say it flattens out. And then on the other side, we, we get the same curvature of space-time. So initially, just where the mass was has flattened out, but nothing outside of that range has, has been affected yet. And then maybe a little later on, as, as a little more time goes by, maybe we get something that looks a little bit more like this. So again, at a certain range, at a certain range, the effect of the sun disappearing has has changed the curvature of space-time but an object out here will still for the moment feel the effect of gravity of the star that is no longer there and as as more time goes by this effect propagates farther and farther out and now at this point now at this point finally the object that was orbiting the star will finally realize that the star is not there anymore, space-time has, has flattened. So this effect, the, the curvature of space-time will propagate out at the speed of light. So gravity in general relativity is not instantaneous. It would take a certain amount of time for that effect on the curvature to propagate out around it. So uh, that is not instantaneous. We had the other issue of, uh, of equal accelerations. And in the Newtonian theory, uh, these kind of two different versions of, of mass, your, your inertial mass and your gravitational mass, and the idea that those were exactly the same seemed like an amazing coincidence in the Newtonian framework. But in the relativity framework, let's say I have some curved, some curved space. So, so here's a representation of my curved space. And general relativity says that small particles, like relatively small particles, will follow straight lines on that curved space time. So maybe, maybe some particle will, will move in, in this direction along that space. And even if the mass is different, 
it's still going to follow this same natural path. The, the path that it takes only depends on the curvature of the space-time that it's moving through. It doesn't depend on the mass of the particle. So different masses have uh, appear to have the same accelerations in, in our frame of reference. So, so it kind of gives us a, a little bit more sensible idea of this equal acceleration idea. The next thing we talked about is the is the orbit of uh, of Mercury. So, so the orbit of Mercury, according to Einstein, or sorry, according to Newton, if I have the Sun here, then the orbit that Mercury takes, if it's a slightly elliptical orbit, this is highly exaggerated, but if it's a slightly elliptical orbit, this orbit will close off on itself. But according to uh, relativity, according to general relativity, if I have the sun here and I trace out the path of, of Mercury, and, and I'm going to try and do this as, as accurately as I can, if I trace out the path of Mercury, the point where Mercury is farthest away from the sun will process around the sun. Uh, this point... Uh, start where this is the direction where Mercury is farthest away, then this is the direction where Mercury is farthest away, and and so on. Instead of the Newtonian picture where it stays at the same place, this position of the of the perihelion, which just means farthest away point, processes. And according to general relativity, this the rate that this processes at should be about 0 0.012 degrees per century and if you actually do the measurements of, of Mercury's position around the Sun over the course of, of a few years and this has been done very accurately taking into account all of the little tugs that all the other planets give to it and, and all of the uh, all of those other effects the last part that you get is this is this 0 0.012 degree per century precession of the perihelion in exact uh, an exact match with what general relativity says. So it, it matches up with that idea. We also had we also have now this idea that uh, light bends around bends around stars. So let's say we have the sun here and the Earth over here, then if I have a star behind the Sun, then the light ray that goes from that star to the Earth is going to be curved. And from our position, we assume that the direction that we see this light coming in at is where the star came from. So if we see it coming in in this direction, we're going to assume that light came from came from a position over here. So this star, this is where the star appears to be to be coming from. And this is where the star actually is. And in in 19 uh, in 1919, a guy by the name of Eddington went on a, on an expedition to observe a solar eclipse. So the, the moon was in the way of the sun, so the sun's light was blocked out, so we didn't have that uh, interfering. And we were, and he was able to take a photograph of the stars that were near the sun. And all of those stars were shifted from their apparent positions in exact match with what Einstein uh, was predicting, what general relativity predicts, the amount of this, uh, this bending angle uh, the, the difference in the apparent position and where the stars actually should be, uh, that exactly matched up with general relativity. So that was in 1919, and it was actually this discovery, this uh, verification of general relativity, that really made headlines around the world. Uh, Newton, who was the fundamental physicist for hundreds of years, was finally toppled by by Einstein's understanding of, of space and time. So so that was a huge verification of relativity. There's also other effects that general relativity predicts, uh, specifically 
the uh, gravitational redshift. Where if I have, let's say I have the Earth here, and I emit light that is, sorry, let me let me redo that, and I emit light that is blue, so it has a has a short wavelength on the ground. As that light moves out of the gravitational well of the Earth, that light the wavelength of that light will stretch out and it will become more red. So the gravitational redshift, if it flies up out of the gravitational well, it will become more and more red to observers farther away. And this changes since the energy of light is dependent on the wavelength, this light is going to be higher energy, this light's going to be lower energy. And the example that I gave in the, in the first, in the issues with uh, Newtonian gravity video, it kind of destroys that concept of a perpetual motion machine, uh, that perpetual motion machine that I kind of described in that, that video. And this also corresponds with the fact that if I'm in a gravitational well, if I'm close to a massive object, then let's say I have a clock down here, so I have some clock and another clock up here, then this clock up here will run faster than this clock down here. This clock will appear to run slower relative to the clock that's farther away from a massive object. And this has been, this very closely matches up with the idea of this, uh, of this gravitational redshift. It has also been measured in, in other experiments, including in GPS systems. GPS satellites, which orbit around the Earth, in order to make those very precise position, me position measurements, they require very accurate clocks in order, to, uh, in order to know where they are and know where you are on the ground. And their clocks, since they're farther up in a gravitational potential, and also since they're moving and we have uh, the time dilation due to the motion, their clocks are going to disagree with clocks on the ground by, I think it's something like a few microseconds every hour. But even that small change over the course of a few days or, or a few weeks would be enough to severely deteriorate the, the accuracy of, of GPS systems. So whenever you turn on your GPS in the car, that depends on, on, uh, on some of this time dilation due to gravity, which is predicted by general relativity and, and matches every experiment we've done. So these are some of the key uh, observations that have verified a lot of these, these weird ideas that we have with general relativity and actually shows that, again, these are real effects that we're, that we're trying to model here. And the issue with, the only issue with this is that all of these tests have been done within the solar system in fairly weak gravitational gravitational fields. There's nowhere in the solar system that the gravity gets close to, say, that of a black hole or a neutron star, these very small, heavy objects. So in the next video, we're going to look at how do we really solve Einstein's equations, uh, not in a math way, but kind of just a conceptually how do we solve them, and how do we look for what happens when we're in stranger situations in more intense gravitational fields. So we'll, we'll talk about that in the next video.